C-L-A-R-T. Okay, and your, and your title or where you're from? Regional Director here in the South Okay, so tell me a little bit about what's going on tonight. What's going on tonight is uh, there's going to be hundreds of people out tonight here rallying to call on the governor and our state legislature to pass a fair share uh, bunch of reforms, uh, fair share tax reforms. Uh, because we feel there is a better way. Currently, the governor and the legislature are really talking about serious cuts to education, to health care, to jobs, to all sorts of vital programs, youth programs, all sorts of programs here in our community. They're cutting SSI, they're doing horrible cuts to the most vulnerable of New Yorkers. We're saying there is a better way. The better way is really instituting a fair share tax reform, which would tax the wealthiest of New Yorkers, raising $6.2 billion, which would enable us to restore the cuts to education, health care, and other vital services. And you know, why is, why is that so important to you? Why are you guys all out here today? Why do you think that, you know, I mean, some people call it the millionaire tax. Why do you think that that is sort of a better answer? Well, it's a better answer because we're asking everyone to pay their fair share. And what we find in New York is people earning $40,000 earn a uh, are paying the same tax rate as someone earning four million dollars. And we feel that that isn't fair. And the only way, and no one, everyone's asked to sacrifice in this budget except the wealthiest of New Yorkers. And we feel it's a better way to tax the wealthiest of New Yorkers, therefore restoring basically jobs to education, to health care, and to other vital services that really affect the most vulnerable of New Yorkers. So what do you hope comes out of this? We hope, and this is being done all around the state, similar budget rallies all around the state, to really draw attention that the community and people are really out here behind the millionaire's tax, <laughs> really looking to restore those education, health care, and other rights. And now after this, you're having, there's a town hall meeting. There's a town hall meeting. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, a representative, so we've invited representatives from uh, the governor, uh, Patterson's office, uh, from Donald Curtis' office, and from Senator Slivitz's office, uh, to hear people who have an opportunity to really express their concerns, share how these budget cuts are really going to impact our community. And I think they'll hear an earful, and hopefully they'll be moved to really do the right thing and pass the fair share of the tax reform. And so you're hoping sort of laying it all on the table, all the new discussions will then they'll hopefully bring it back up to Albany? And to understand really these cuts on paper maybe don't seem that drastic, but when you bring it to the community and the community people really speak to it, you really see how devastating this cuts are. And now the fair share tax reform would, would tax people over $250,000. Now what do you say that, you know, proponents, people who are against this, this reform say that, you know, the, the rich already pay their share. What do you say about this? Well, they really don't. When someone's earning $40,000 paying the same tax rate as someone earning $4 million, that isn't, that isn't the fair. It isn't fair.
today, not only in Binghamton, but across New York State, to send the message to Governor Patterson and all of our state legislators to say, stop balancing New York State's budget deficit on the backs of working families. Our state representatives have asked us all to share the sacrifice. Is it fair that we ask our teachers and students here in Binghamton to sacrifice their opportunity for a quality education by cutting $8.2 million in funding to their schools, which will lead to teacher layoffs and larger classroom sizes? No. Is it fair to ask our nurses and doctors to decrease medical services they provide by cutting over $6.5 million to our hospitals here in Broome County? No. So it seems to me that the only sacrifice that is being made is on the behalf of working families. My organization released a report on Tuesday showing that these cuts especially hit communities and families of color the hardest. These disparities are most obvious in education and social services. This reminds us that there is no economic justice without racial justice. We have an opportunity to not only restore funding to vital services that all New Yorkers depend on, but also increase significant revenue to address our state deficit. And what is that opportunity, you may ask? The Fair Share Tax Reform Plan. Under our current tax system, a person earning $40,000 pays the same amount in income tax as a person earning $4 million. So let's put that into context. Your school teacher, your nurse, your construction worker pay the same amount in income tax as a CEO on Wall Street. If we were to pass the Fair Share Tax Reform Plan here in New York State, it would generate more than $6.2 billion by increasing taxes on 2% of wealthy New Yorkers that make more than $250,000 a year. This would not only preserve vital services, but also save jobs for tens and thousands of people in our area. Supporting the Fair Share Tax Reform Plan is not just an economic issue, it's a civil rights issue. When you realize that these cuts hit middle income, working class, low income people, children, people of color, and immigrants, the hardest uh, this issue becomes more than just dollars and cents. It's our moral duty. We got in this mess because for years we've asked less and less from those with the most, giving the rich tax cut after tax cut. Now we're finally asking them to pay their fair share. So, to further uh, expound on this issue, we have a couple of speakers. So I would like to bring up David Lee, who is the president of CSEA Local Chapter 648. David Lee. Thank you and thank you all for being here. SUNY Binghamton is looking at major cuts. If the major cuts happen, where are the places gonna go for students to go to college? Are we gonna send them out of state? Are we gonna send them to another area? We already have a problem bringing the young people here and keeping them here. What's gonna to happen to New York State when they raise the education? And it's not just raising it. He's gonna raise it by $620, and only 20% of that is gonna to go towards the SUNY system. Where's the 80% going? To the black hole, I guess. To some great big area of unknown where they can spend it wherever they'd like. Governor Patterson put a lot of press out about taking away our contract. There's over a thousand contracts that CSEA writes around New York State. It's not just walking in and changing a contract. They take years to write. It would be like saying, I don't enjoy my house anymore. I don't like my car anymore. Just take it back and don't hold it against me. You can't do it. It's a contract, and it was a contract done in negotiations, and it was a fair contract. And that goes along with taking away five days' pay. If he takes away five days' pay across New York State, that's over 300,000 people. What's that going to do for the economy? Is it going to help the economy? Oh, I don't no. think so. So we need to stand up. We need to stand up for the state employees. We need to stand up for the students. We got to stand up for everybody because our society is going to change if this continues. When you're going down these roads and you start hitting these potholes and there's nobody there to fix them, you're not going to be happy. Let's make sure we let the governor know how we feel. Thank you. Thank you, David. I now would like to bring up Utku Balaban. He is a member of the uh, Graduate Student Employees Union. Yay! Yay! 
Thank you, thank you. First of all, I'm very disappointed. Um, after Pataki, you know, we had you know like great big expectations from this near you know like governor, um, Spitzer, he was gone, and then like you know Peterson came again, like you know big big expectations in terms of you know salary increases, rise, etc. You know nothing. So the great disappointment, and like you know, I cannot even express this. You know, I mean, like I should maybe talk you know for one hour or so. But let me tell you one single thing. Do you know how much a teaching assistant you know makes a year? Eight thousand ninety-three dollars for the whole year. Eight thousand dollars. And what percentage of the courses do we teach in the SUNY system? Forty-seven percent. In other words, you know, like, you know, if you know, a student or industry assistant takes a course, there's you know, like one half chance that that course is taught by a teaching assistant, and that guy is probably going to get approximately $8,000 a year. How is he supposed to pay his, you know, like, you know, rent, you know, all of the basic stuff? Not possible. And for how long have, been, have we been nego like negotiating our contract? For more than two years. We want nothing but a just fair and equal yeah, yeah. no. We are paid the lowest in the country. No, that's fair. Eight hundred and ninety three dollars. Well, I'll see you the rest of you inside. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, we did not, you know, get anything two weeks ago. I was in the negotiating table. You know, like the bureaucrats of the you know, government said, you know, uh, what we demand, you know, was fair, but they said, we don't have money. You know, I mean, I think you know, the basic problem here, again, in terms of the redistribution of the income in the entire, uh, like, you know, state, and also in the SUNY budget, moreover, you know, like, you know, TAs and GAs, you know, like, are both students and employees. We pay, you know, the tuitions they ask, you know, like, uh, us to pay. But what we get is only just a peanut. And you know, what we get is in the total, you know, SUNY budget, you know, doesn't make more than your two percent. Again, two percent. Um I think you know we should fight for the for the bread, we should fight, you know, for our bread, we should fight for our intelligence, we should fight for you know what we really deserve. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Mary Twitchell. She is the president of PEF. Mary? I just got a promotion. Actually, I'm the Region 5 coordinator for PEF, uh, representing about 2,000 members within the five county area. And I didn't want to come here today. I told Mary Clark that it's called that. But unfortunately, we all had to be here today because we were hopeful, as we always try to be hopeful, that they will listen and they will change their minds. But they haven't, so we're back here again, and we're going to keep coming back and keep pounding on people until they listen to us. And because I tend to prattle on and on, any of you that heard me speak the last time, I decided I'm just going to read an excerpt from a letter that all of our members have been asked to send to uh, their legislators. Uh, and, I, you know, I, we've already had two other state employee groups speak, so I feel a little self-conscious, but I'm going to read it anyway because my members are here, and I know that you're, you're, out, you're going to support us as we support you and as we take care of your families, your mothers, your fathers in our nursing homes, uh, in, in our mental health facilities, in your drug treatment centers, do the roads, disability analysts. I'm going to read this now. Okay. <laughs> state employees and retirees are middle-class taxpayers 
taxpayers who will be affected by the spending cuts and tax increases in the proposed budget, just like any other citizens in the state of New York. People seem to forget that. There was an article in the paper about, you know, state workers, and I have to pay, I have my, their salaries are paid with my tax money. And I said, damn, I didn't know we didn't have to pay taxes. State employees pay taxes too, believe me. Okay. Um, for the typical PEF member, the governor's proposals would take away about $2,800 of income for 2009. The impact on certain retirees could be up to 5435 annually because of the proposed shift in health costs. Aside from the blatant inequity in targeting public employees, the proposed elimination of salary increases, lagging of pay, and a por uh, portion of the Tier 5 proposal are violations of a negotiated labor agreement signed by Governor Patterson. Taking such action through legislation would destroy the collective bargaining process. Although the federal stimulus recently signed into law by President Obama does not close the budget gap in its entirety, it certainly diminishes any justification for the governor's most draconian cuts, such as public employee layoffs and a unilateral wage and benefits takeaways. In addition, alternatives to harmful cuts have been explored, such as reducing the state's wasteful use of pro private consultants, yes. or ensuring that the wealthiest New Yorkers pay their fair, in tax, fair share in taxes. Yes. So I urge you to stand up for the middle class by rejecting parts Z, A, A, B, B, C, C, and E, e of Senate Bill 56 slash Assembly Bill A156, which would diminish the salary and benefits of active and retired public employees and by fighting against state employee layoffs. You know, when I was at... Um, at BCC, when the governor was in town, we talked to him, and one of the things we talked about was reopening the contract. And the man did stand there and lie to my face. I was good. I didn't say no, I know, because this budget bill basically is in there to nullify our raises and to break our contract. And he said, oh, no, I can't do that. We can't do that. We can't reopen the contract unless you agree to it. It's in there, folks. We're one labor union. I know there's other labor unions here. Basically what this is, is union busting at the ultimate level. And what do we say about union busting? Disgusting! Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, as our state legislators have called all of us to share the sacrifice and to shoulder the burden, there are some of us who um, are being even even further unfairly asked to sacrifice, and especially in the area of the cuts that are being proposed to uh, SSI. So to have someone speak uh, directly to that issue is Carol Kramer. She is a counselor with the Southern Tier Independence Center. Carol? Yay. Yay. Hi, everybody. Um, SSI cuts, it's unbelievable. I mean, I work with people, I have a couple of family members that receive SSI, and um, I know that their budgeting is like really creative just to make it through each month. And um, the $87 state supplement is, um, hasn't been increased for, I, I forgot how many years now, it's always been the same. 20 years. Thank you. Years. Thank you. Yes. Forgot that thing. So, um, I don't know. An individual on SSI gets seven hundred and sixty-one dollars a month. Okay. The lucky ones. Yeah. The lucky ones. Yeah, right. Right. About that. right. And uh, so, if they live alone, or you know, and they're not living with others, or they're responsible for their own support. But I noticed in Binghamton that the rents have gone way, way up. They're skyrocketing. I mean, you can rent a place for $600 and pay your own utilities, and you're getting $761. I was helping some folks look for apartments, and it was like, okay, you found one for like $325 or $425, but I wouldn't want to live there. I wouldn't expect anybody to live there. So, um, you know, so if you pay your own utilities, you know, if you pay electric and gas, your NYSEC bill is going to be like 150 at least a month. And then if you have a telephone, oh, sorry, 
I'm not talking into the mic, excuse me. A telephone would be like $30, that's, you know, whatever. And then you've got your groceries, your, um, I know some people get, yeah, the, yeah, utilities, right, other utilities, yeah, paying for heat, fees, right. I mean, some people get food stamps, but the food stamps do not cover the whole month. Right. And, uh, you know, and depending on your living situation, food stamps varies whether you pay utilities or you don't pay utilities. And some people get very little. So, and the other thing is that most people don't have cars. They have to take a bus. Broome County recently increased the bus for the disabled pass that went from $22 to $27.50 a month. So, so that's another increase. Regular bus, 40 yeah, and um, it's just more expensive to live in Binghamton. And then they don't they have washers and dryers. They have to go to the laundromat. You know, that costs money, putting those quarters in the slot, watching your stuff go, you know, your money just goes. And, um, you know, they don't live in luxury. And I, you know, I can see it in my own family and the people that I work with. And um, they work very hard to take care of themselves the best they can. I mean, they have to buy shampoo and deodorant like the rest of us, toothpaste, all that good stuff, and your soap, and you know, so that at least they can go out in society and look presentable and not smell bad, <laughs> you know. So. And then sometimes we still have to walk because we can't afford the bus passes. Right. right. And some folks don't buy the bus pass. Mm -hmm. They end up walking everywhere. And you know how this winter's been. Ugh, yeah. I wouldn't want to be out there walking when that wind's blowing. So, folks, you know, we've got to stop the SSI cuts. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So our, our last speaker will be uh, Binghamton Mayor Ryan. He's always come out on the uh, right side of the issues in regards to labor and other issues here in our community. Binghamton Mayor Ryan. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I think the sign, I, being an executive, I know that it's difficult to balance a budget in these tough times, but I think the message we have to get out to the governor is we need what most of the signs here is a fair budget. And a fair budget in New York State means protecting the most vulnerable people in our society. And I think that's what we really need to do. When the governor comes and says, uh, I won't consider the millionaire's tax until you give me all these cuts, I think the millionaire's tax should be one of the first things that he considers and try to make sure not to underestimate what that revenue would be uh, to uh, to get uh, pay down this uh, big deficit, but to uh, realize what the real potential there is for uh, closing this gap that we all have to do. I mean, the reality is uh, many states across the nation are facing the same crisis, California even worse than us, but uh, we, we all have to work together to create a fair budget that protects those most vulnerable, that uh, allows education to go forward and allows health care to be the best it can be in New York State. So um, I applaud all your efforts in making the governor here. I think he is listening somewhat, but I, um, I do empathize with them a little bit knowing how tough it is right now but I think that your voices are so important to make sure that uh, all these concerns are heard and heard loudly so uh, thank you, thank you. the uh, the rally no one here is saying that we're not in a financial crisis no one is saying that but we're saying there are smart more strategic ways to address New York State's budget deficit and one of those is not balancing the budget on the backs of working families okay the other thing that we're saying is that if we were to pass the fair share tax reform plan in New York State it would generate 6.2 billion dollars and it only we're asking our millionaires to pay less than one percent of their income to go towards addressing this budget deficit. And we don't think it's fair that we're asking people to, who receive SSI to sacrifice 3% of their income to address the budget deficit. Where we're not asking those that can afford to pay more to even pay 1%. Does that seem fair to you guys? Yeah.
So in conclusion, we're saying to Governor Patterson and all of our state legislators to stop balance, uh, balancing New York State's budget deficit on the backs of working families and really invest here on the ground in the areas of education and health care. Those are our two largest employers here in, here in New York State. And if you're cutting those two areas, then where are you going to take New York to in the next century if you're not investing on the ground where it counts? Right? <laughs> We're saying be strategic, be smart, but most importantly, stop balancing the budget deficit on the backs of working families. We can't continue to shoulder this burden alone. Everyone needs to do their fair share here in New York State. So I know some people were saying some chants, you know, a few seconds ago. So if we want to do that a little while, and then we're going to go inside for the town hall where you can get warm and have some food, and then we'll start our program. Is that all right with everybody? Yeah. Is that all right with everybody? Yeah. Got to keep the energy up. Okay. We out here fighting. You can't be fighting. You're all timid and cold. <laughs> Got to be strong. <laughs> okay. So how about a real, real simple chant that basically says no to the cuts? Can everybody do that? No. Yes, that seems simple, right? So let's start that. Fair. No. Fair budget. Oh, we'll say no to the cuts. We need a fair budget. Can we do that? No to the cuts. We need a fair budget. My name is Leah Webb. I am a community organizer with Citizen Action of New York. I am also on Binghamton City Council, so I wear two hats. <laughs>all over New York State. So it's not just happening here in Binghamton, it's happening in Syracuse, Rochester, Albany, Buffalo, New York City. People have gathered, thousands and thousands of people have gathered from all over the state this night to send the message, this very important message to our state legislators to stop balancing the budget deficit on the backs of working families. So now I am going to introduce our wonderful panel and then we'll go right into the program. So first to my right is Candy Stroud. She is with NYSA. Give Candy a round of applause. She'll be talking about education. Our next panelist is Anna Shiloh Johnson. She is the Youth Bureau Director for the City of Binghamton. Anna will be talking about the impacts of the budget on youth services. Next, we have Daryl Wood, who is the president of UUP at Binghamton University. We also have Ed Ruiz. Did I say that right? All right, I'm doing good. <laughs> See, it's good to get education. You need to actually do something. <laughs> he is the administrative organizer with 1199 SEIU. Give Ed a round of applause. And our final two panelists are Susie Link, who is a counselor with the Southern Independent Center, and Carol Kramer, who is also a counselor at the Southern Independent Center. So let's jump right into it. So our first speaker is Candy Stroud. She is going to talk about the uh, cuts uh, to education. Let me just lay a little groundwork first. So in Governor Patterson's budget proposal for this year, he's proposing to cut $2.5 billion to education. So what does that mean, $2.5 billion, this large figure? Well, that means you're going to have larger classroom sizes. There's also the possibility of teachers being laid off. Uh, as well as after school programs being cut, a lot of vital services that really give our youth an opportunity to receive an education in our community and across the state and our country is at stake. And that's just a little of the groundwork. So I'm going to have Candy go in a little more detail about that. Candy Straub. Thank you all for, t for making the time in your busy schedules to be with us tonight. My name is Candy Stroud, and as a New York State United teacher member, I'm pleased to be with you this evening to represent the many NYSET professionals who not only live in the Southern Tier, but also work in our schools, on our college campuses, and in our health care centers. The U.S. Department of Labor reports 2.6 million American jobs disappeared in 2008. 
the most since World War II. And more than 11 million people are currently looking for work. These statistics are staggering, and I don't have to tell you that the toll on many middle and lower income Americans has been devastating. Many of us already know someone, a friend, a family member, or a neighbor who has lost a job or had their hours cut, seen salaries reduced while their mortgages are raised, and to add insult to injury, have had to suffer through services being deferred to the point of extinction. When Governor Patterson released his proposed $121 billion budget for 2009 to 10, late last year, he said the state had long lived beyond its means and called for shared sacrifices. In the package, he made massive cuts to education, health care, and social services, and added about 137 new taxes and fees as a way to close a $15.4 billion budget gap over two years. Under the governor's definition of shared, sacri shared sacrifices, aid to schools would be cut by $2.5 billion, a 12% reduction from the current amount promised under the state's formula to address in in inequities highlighted in the Campaign for Fiscal Equity Court decision. Interrupting the formula now will not only set us back in our shared goal of closing the achievement gap, but will also retard the gains already made in, an in, in increasing student performance. By Governor Patterson's definition, shared sacrifices not only means budget cuts, but also new fees, taxes, surcharges on sugary sodas, movies, health insurance, clothing, haircuts, and countless other basic necessities that particularly affect the poor and middle class. As Governor Patterson defines it, shared sacrifices means a regressive state <coughs> income tax in which we have the same tax rate whether you're making $4,000, $400,000, or $4 million. Contrary to what has been said by some in Albany about shared sacrifices, the pain in this budget is not spread evenly, nor will its effects be felt equitably. As things stand now, working middle class families will bear the vast majority of the pain. The billions of dollars in cuts the governor has proposed for schools and health care institutions would trigger tens of thousands more layoffs and hurt society's most vulnerable precisely at the time that they are counting on and need strong public services to help them through this crisis. As a society, we have a responsibility to not only do our part to fix a broken economy, but to also ensure that its victims get what they need to get back on their feet. The budget proposal Governor Patterson presented to the legislature cannot be allowed to define us. That proposal, if enacted, reduces or eliminates essential services and programs to middle and lower income families. At the same time, it allows too many of our wealthiest citizens to avoid their responsibility to the common good. While the governor continues to talk about shared sacrifices, he presents a budget that raises taxes not nearly enough on those who can afford it the most and unfairly burdens those who can afford it the least. Taxes on our health insurance, our clothing, haircuts, and countless other basic necessities is bad fiscal policy. Bad public policy is regressive and is just plain wrong. If Governor Patterson truly wants to walk the talk about shared sacrifices, then real and meaningful tax reform must be part of the solution. New York State has cut its top personal income tax rate by more than 50% over the last 30 years, from 15.375% to 6.85%. Tax cuts enacted since 1994 are reducing state revenues by more than $16 billion annually. These are funds the state can ill afford to forego in the tough economic times of today and the even tougher times of tomorrow. To our legislatures, I, I urge you to raise the revenue to avoid the harmful cuts that will undoubtedly befall us if Governor Patterson's proposed budget is enacted. I'm confident that your steady leadership and good counsel will help guide us through this difficult time in the most fair and thoughtful way possible. NYSET and our members are waiting, watching, and counting on you to stand strong and advocate for the sustainable funding necessary to close our ever-widening economic gap. Thank you, Henry. So I just want to ask a couple of questions to the group as a whole, okay? So my first question is, what do movie tickets, and I will repeat it, what do movie tickets, taxi rides, soda, beer, 
wine, cigars, cable, and satellite TV, and downloaded music all have in common? All tasks. You guys are good. Okay. Wow. I can't fool you guys. Um, that's correct. Governor Patterson proposes to tax them to raise $4.1 billion from New Yorkers. He also wants to reinstate sales taxes on clothing costing less than $110. No. Right. I'm just I'm <laughs> presenting the information. <laughs> One more question, and then I also will have uh, two young women, uh, Kyle and Kira Lewis. They actually are two uh, elementary school students that would like to uh, share uh, their story in regards to education. So I'll ask one more question, see if you guys can keep up, okay? Who will lose $26 million in state funding over the next two years if Governor Patterson's budget passes? Public libraries. <gasps> libraries are often the place where students and others, uh, as well as immigrants, go to improve their language skills. And the recently unemployed work on their resumes as well as a vital part of the cultural education of our community. So our public libraries, OK? So I will now have Kyla and Kiera. They will come up here. They are two elementary school students. They actually spoke at the town hall that we had many moons ago. It was actually February 11th. And they're just going to share some uh, their, their story in regards to education. So give them a round of applause. Give it up for the youth. Hi, everybody. I'm Kiera Frank. And we need this money for our schools, for our books for our after-school program in art. <laughs> so if the government takes this money away from us, what are we going to do? Are we going to learn or have less education? Um, um, we're losing lots of money in our schools already. Um, for like, we need more school supplies, and if we get our money ticket away, then we will have less school supplies, less m books, and I love to read and do art and stuff, especially my art room because it has less materials than last year. So, do we want our money to be away from our schools? No. no. So, should the government's money pass? No. no. So we should help support our schools and our libraries. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. So our, our next panel speaker is um, Anna Shalo Johnson. So I'm going to ask a couple more questions before I bring her on, because I said we'll keep this interactive so we don't you know, get in the day with all the stats. We want to keep you guys, you know, your pulse still uh, going and everyone, plus you got the food in you, it's going to settle. We'll make sure you're still with us, okay? So, another question. How many public school employees across upstate New York and Long Island could be laid off if Governor Patterson's budget passes? I'll repeat that again. How many public school employees across upstate New York and Long Island could be laid off if Governor Patterson's budget passes? Just, how many? Don't have anything. Oh, okay. Um, Six thousand in uh, in upstate New York and fifteen thousand in New York City could lose their jobs. That is way too many. Okay. One is too many. I agree. I agree. And my my last question before I turn it over to Miss Johnson. This is a true or false question. Okay. New Yorkers want to see millionaires pay a higher percentage of taxes to help balance the state budget. True or false? Okay. All right. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> a, a Quinnipiac University poll of nearly 2,000 New York State residents showed 79% support for boosting taxes on those who earn at least $1 million a year. And this was according to the New York Post on February 18th of this year. Okay. So... With that being said, I will now have Anna Shalo Johnson come up and speak. She is the uh, director of the uh, Youth Bureau for the City of Binghamton. And one of the things that happens quite often in a budget deficit is that our, our lawmakers often have a tendency to cut education and health care. 
but then turn around and say we need to invest in our community. Well, what community are they investing in, right? And so when you're talking about the future of New York, the, the place you would start would be with youth. And to have these drastic cuts happen to youth services on the prevention side will be very detrimental. And so Ms. Johnson is going to talk a little bit more about that. Good evening, everyone. I am Anishelle O. Johnson. I am the city of Binghamton's first youth bureau director. And in the first two years that I have been here, I can say it has been an amazing journey, one I'm not sorry I took on, nor am I sorry about anything that has been going on in our community. I want all of you to be aware that the city of Binghamton has some of the most enterprising, educated, amazing, entrepreneurial young people that you will ever, ever, ever meet. And when you have that opportunity to interact with one of our young folks, please look at them as the educated, amazing, uh, entrepreneurial. Um, I can't, there, there's not enough adjectives to describe our young people. You just have to take the time to get to know them and know where they stand. And in youth development, we have a saying, you need to meet them where they are. And that's what we need to do as folks. Um, as Leah stated, this particular budget proposal is going to affect youth development, delinquency programming, and preventative services. That's called YDD and, y and SDDP services or prevention money. The proposed budget cut is a 24.5% overall budget along all New York state lines. That funding cut would affect the preventative measures, which we used to get about $1.2 billion, and it's knocking it down to about $990 million. Now, please keep in mind that this is across the state, and there are several youth bureaus, not only in upstate, but in central as well as downstate, that provide preventative services to our young people. Now, you might ask, what is a preventative service? You know those after-school programs that run from 3.30 to 6 o'clock in the evening? Do you know, like, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, the Haven, which is a local after-school program in our area, services administered by the Urban League, Catholic Charities, TTLP. I can go on and on about the services that are available in our community, programs that are offered by STEP, by Planned Parenthood, those organizations that sometimes we don't want to hear their name, but they are actually educating our young people to be leaders within our community. These particular organizations are definitely going to be affected by this particular budget cut. In addition to that, not only are we facing a budget cut, but we're also facing something that's called a youth programming block grant. Now, what that particular thing is going to do is not only have us take the budget cut that's going to supposedly that's going to be imposed across state lines, across all budgets, but it's going to combine all of that money and all of those services into one thing, one grant. Now, when I say services, I'm not just talking about preventative services. I'm talking about secure and non-secure detention services, which are mandated by New York State. So when you think about a block grant or you think about one lump sum grant, and all of the services have to be administered from this grant, and you know you have mandated services, what's going to go first? What, what do we have to supply first? Those mandated services. And sometimes those mandated services do cost quite a bit more than what preventative services do cost. Um, I don't know if, if many of you remember, but there were newspaper articles across the state saying that New York State was able to close some of their detention um, services or, or their detention um, facilities. Do you have any idea why that is? <coughs> because of preventative services. Think about it. When you grab a young person, whether they're 7 years old or 18 years old, and you are getting them right when they're marginal, right when they're on the edge, and provide them with prevention services, whether it's a mentor, whether it's an after-school program, whether it's something that's going to occupy their minds, and you're able to change them by giving them the tools that allow them to change themselves, you keep them out of detention. If that partic those particular funds are now deferred or deterred from preventative services, how, how do you think that's going to increase detention measures? Okay. Yes, it is. Back in December, city and county officials met with Senate Majority Leader Malcolm Smith, and they did express to him their concerns about this particular pr proposed budget and how it would affect the preventative measures within our county as well as in within the city of Binghamton. 
Many, many community members, once it hit the press that this was a possibility, sent letters, sent um, emails, made phone calls to not only our local legislators and county officials, as well as our city council folks, but also mailed letters to Governor Patterson. We had several young people who felt very, very empowered by writing the letters themselves to the governor to, tell, to ask him, you know, is there anything that we can do to help you with this budget because we really, really need these services? And if there's anything that we can do to assist you with balancing the budget, finding other opportunities to make these monies work, please ask us. Now, don't you think that's some ingenuity that you have a young person who cares that much for their particular program that they're going to write a letter and offer their service? They didn't point a finger. They basically asked him, what can we do? In addition to that, City Council, once they found out about this, passed a resolution asking Governor Patterson to please reconsider the proposed budget. I think that's actually an uh, outpouring of our community and showing that we understand what these preventative measures mean for our young people. In addition to this, our prevention services assist our school district. Our school district is able to use after-school programming, mentoring, and tutoring uh, facilities to assist them with giving that extra push to that young fifth grader who may need help with his handwriting, or the person who needs to study for their spelling words for Friday's test, and they still do Monday spelling words for Friday tests. Don't, don't let your kids tell you that they don't. <laughs> <laughs> They do SAT prep, ACT prep, PSAT prep. They do Regents prep. I mean, Saturday school is something that's based on volunteers as well as other organizations that feel the necessity to have this within our community. If we don't provide these, pre these services to our young folks, then we're going to have a lot more young people dropping out of school. Their families are going to feel disheartened. And then we won't have a leg to stand on or a window to piss out of. And, and that's an expression from my grandmother. I was the one wondering what she meant by that, but I'm beginning to understand now. <laughs> so with this said, we have to understand that we need to empower ourselves, write more letters, make more phone calls, send more emails, show up at more town hall meetings to employ Governor Patterson to please reconsider the proposed budget cut as it stands. We understand that New York State is in peril. We understand that there, something has to be done, but on the backs of our young people that are supposed to be our future, if we don't give them a foundation or a grounding to stand on, we don't have a future. And those of us in this room are going to be working until we are 80, 90, 110 years old. Thank you. So, as promised, to keep this interactive, you guys are you guys still with me? Yes. Okay. All right. Giving you a lot of information, but again, this is really a sharing uh, session. We really want you to understand what's happening. So, when you go out, when you leave this building tonight, moving forward, we only have until April first. You'll have an understanding of what the issues are. And more importantly, you can relay the information that we need real reform here in New York State. So, next question. What percentage of Broome County residents earn over $1 million? <laughs> okay, gotta laugh. <laughs> I'll repeat that again. Okay. <laughs> what percentage of Broome County residents earn over $1 million? 5%. 5%? 0.25. Ooh, that's real. Okay. Well, the answer is one tenth of one percent. Only three fifths of one percent earn over two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And under the fair share tax plan, only eight hundred and two Broome County residents would see a tax increase. Okay. Next question. Okay. In the Binghamton City School District, how much money does Governor Patterson propose to cut our elementary, school, our elementary school classrooms by? Any figure? Throw it out there. Give me a 1,000. I'm just kidding. I'm not watching it. I'm just kidding. Any, any ideas? Any thoughts? Okay, that sounds like right. Exactly. Too. But the answer is $23,210. And he proposes cutting $28,671 per eighth grade English classroom. 
And this came from the Fiscal Policy Institute and the Alliance for Quality Education. Okay. Our next speaker, actually our, our next personal story uh, will be from Kevin Maines. Is Kevin? Oh, okay. So Kevin is going to speak in regards to some of the things that you're hearing in the media, local and across the board, is our economy is in the tank, right? No one will argue with you on that. People are getting laid off all over the country by thousands and thousands. You have people lining up even more so today for food banks and food pantries. A lot of people who are applying for unemployment, people losing their health care, all of these you know, really dark statistics that are plaguing our local community and our state as a whole. And uh, Kevin is actually going to share his personal story. So if everyone can give your attention to Kevin Maines. Kevin? Thank you, Leah. Can you all hear me? Hello? Yeah. Okay, yeah. because back here you can't hear up there, okay. Um, my name's Kevin Main, uh, and that's M-A-I-N for those taking notes, no E, I'm not a, I'm not a member of that family. Um, I'm 51 years old, and I uh, have been recently unemployed, so I guess I stand here as the face of the unemployed so far. Uh, there's others in this room. I. Uh, Worked at uh, Hurley Heat Trucking Company, a local trucking company, from 1988 until 2008 of last year. After an 18-month um, organized union busting campaign on the part of the company, uh, me, my brothers and sisters have worked there, and I had 20 years with them, no longer employed there. Um, and that went unnoticed by the local media, if any of you are left here. Uh, in the millennium, during the, during the summer of 08, I was fortunate enough to uh, get on the, the local job with the Millennium Pipeline. Um, where I'm going with this is that in 1987, I suffered some uh, heart problems. And it wasn't a heart attack, but it was, it's, it was costly as far as my medications now, where I've got to take eight medications a day. Um, so. Becoming unemployed, that was the first thing that came to my mind. Where am I gonna get my uh, insurance from? Uh, I got through the summer and I still have insurance. However, a lot of you might not know this. Um, we, we, I've heard people speaking that, um, and, and today outside and in, in this room, about those, uh, the, the unfortunate that can get help, um, those that, that, are, uh, that are poor, um, the middle class, though, I want you to know, like myself, I cannot get any help right now. There is no health insurance. If you don't have health insurance, the uh, programs in New York State offer are for those that are poverty stricken, and by that, they go back against your last year. So obviously, I made an income last year. Now that I don't have an income other than unemployment, uh, it's my responsibility to come up with health care. Thanks to a good union contract, I still am, am carrying health care, but it's going to be cut if I don't find work soon, and that would be union work. Um, the COBRA is very expensive, obviously, for many of you legislators. You know that you've gotten us that in the past, but COBRA is not for everybody because you still have to pay in order to buy it, and uh, when you're unemployed, obviously, you know the problems with that. After, and even if you can't afford the COBRA, you still have to, you still have to worry about co-payments. Uh, uh, by that I mean walking into the doctor, co-payments here, co-payments there. When you're getting uh, uh, uninsurance or unemployment insurance at $405 a week, and if you uh, if you choose to take the 10% uh, federal withdrawal for taxes, we're talking uh, $350 or, or $345 to take home a, a week. Uh, insurance is is half, if not more, of that a week. Um, so basically what I, what I would like to say is that uh, uh, in, in conjunction with what's being said here tonight is that as far as health insurance goes, and that's, that's where, I, where I have a worry um, right now, of course it could get worse. I mean, we, I was able to put away a little bit of money knowing that we were going to become, un or I was going to become unemployed. Um, but where we're at right now is the taxes. And of course, I believe that the one or two percent and, and finding money from other sources rather than soda pop and what, the, what, what things that are 
the everyday person is spending that, I think it's important that we find the money that's needed from other sources, and that money here is in the highest paid in New York State. As Kevin said, there are, uh, he's one of hundreds and thousands of others who have become recently laid off. Uh, how many people in this room know someone that was recently laid off or lost their job? Okay, good portion, about half. Um, again, I, I, the purpose of us really sharing this is that it's not just about numbers or statistics, it's to really put a face behind these cuts and who it's impacting to send that message. Um, our next speaker is Daryl Wood. He is the president of UUP. Can everyone give a round of applause for Daryl Wood? He'll be coming up and speaking. And I have one quick trivia question <laughs> before it comes up, so I want to make sure you guys are still with me. Sorry, Daryl, I just, I just realized that. You could, I know I'll hear about it later on after we're done. Um, <laughs> the Bigger Better Bottle Bill would require deposits on bottled water, iced tea, and sports drinks. It would also require beverage companies to return unclaimed bottle deposits to the state rather than keep the money as profits. So my question is, how much money would the beverage industry return to the state if this law was passed? $200 million a year. Close. Close. Any other um, ideas? Four, four, four million. $140 million. Wow. That's, that's, that's until you expand the pool. Now, when you expand the pool for the other containers, mm -hmm. your right. wealth has $200 million yep. a year that belongs to consumers and that's unclaimed That's right. And uh, it was always held up in the Senate. You might note that uh, Senator Bruno, ex Senator Bruno, regularly got donations from these bottling companies. And that's why we haven't gotten a bad bottle bill in the last 15 years that we've been trying. Thank you. Thank you for that. Going to jail? Yep. Oh, he's indicted at the moment. Yes. He needs a fair yes. trial that yes. he's going to jail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I said I wanted to keep interactive. Thank you, sir. OK, so now, are you guys still OK? OK. Our next speaker, I like this energy, this is good. All right, so now, Daryl, <laughs> you can come on now. Everyone give Daryl a round of applause for the UC. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, being given the opportunity to speak to you tonight, and I am really impressed with, uh, there you go, you, now you can hear me better in the back. I'm really impressed with, with all of you and the young people that are here and the, the commitment you've made to uh, yeah. making the state of New York a better place to live. I want to make just a, a couple of points. Um, we all know we have very, very serious economic problems, not only in New York State, uh, but uh, around the country, literally around the world. Um, and we, we're going to come out of it. We all know we're going to come out of it. Um, and there's a there's something you have to do, I mean, and, and it's happened in the past, and, and people are doing it already, is the way you get out of economic problems is you have to plan for the future. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways you plan for the future is that you educate the people who are going to get us out of these economic <coughs> problems. Cuts to education, whether they're in the, the K-12 or in higher ed, essentially is eating your seed corn, just to use one of those old uh, kind of saws from a long time ago. Uh, it is an investment in the future. If we don't educate our young people, who is going to take care of us when I get a little bit grayer than I am now, mm -hmm. and those young people who are here are going to get a lot grayer. Uh, we have to maintain those kinds of services because if we don't, we're going to have very, very serious problems. In every economic downturn that's occurred in the past, what do people do? They say, times are bad, maybe I'm not working as much as I can, what I should do is go back to school, mm -hmm. get, it, get a better education, prepare for the next job, okay? Uh, specifically at Binghamton, they already have over 30,000 applications for uh, enrollment at Binghamton this coming year. That's up. We're only going to, going to accept 2,700 students this coming fall. Think about that for a moment, okay? There are tens of thousands of students in New York State who want to attend who will not be able to get a college education because of these cuts, okay? 
You may know that the governor has proposed, and actually they've already implemented, a tuition increase. It's actually started this semester and it's going to go up again in the fall. Supposedly, SUNY's going to be able to keep 20% of that tu those tuition dollars. Guess what? The Division of Budget is playing with the numbers. And they're assuming a much higher enrollment than actually what's going to occur. So that 20% that supposedly SUNY's going to be able to keep, the reality is SUNY Binghamton campus is going to have to give back 10%. 10% we're going to lose because supposedly we're going to get 20%. And where is the other 80% going? It's going someplace else. It's not going to support the education of the students who are coming to Binghamton and across the state at other SUNY campuses. This is a very serious problem. Um, I think the only other, only other, well, two, two other things I just want to say to you. Number one is, um, you probably have heard the term an economic multiplier. An economic multiplier, for those of you who don't know, essentially is how many times a dollar invested in a local community turns over before it leaves the area. So when you buy a loaf of bread at the supermarket, okay, it not only goes into somebody's pocket as uh, you know the the, uh, the the owner's pocket but it also goes to pay for the cashier and the stock person and uh, they're going to spend you know their little bit of, of money and they're going to buy a, 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 a shirt okay and that the price of that shirt is going to help pay for a cashier as well and it turns over in the community before it leaves for the university that uh, economic multiplier is is around six times so for every dollar that the state invests in higher education locally, it turns over six times before it leaves the community. The, the planned cuts to SUNY will mean a $10 million cut to Binghamton, to wow. the campus, which means that that's a $60 million hit to the local community. $60 million are going to get lost because of the cuts that the governor has proposed to SUNY. The last thing I want to tell you is something I just want to repeat and, and, and emphasize something that's been said before and it's kind of an undercurrent of everything that's happening tonight, which is you can make a difference. Okay? It is your phone calls, your letters, your stopping your legislators on the street, going to their office. When they hear from you, they will respond. When more of you talk to them, they will do what you ask them to do. It is so essential that they hear from you. So with that, I'm going to say thank you and talk to them. Thank you. Before we go to our next speaker, as promised, we're going to have another what? Trivia question. All right. So, OK. Uh, just to add on to what Daryl was saying, uh, a lot of times when you're in uh, an economic downturn, economists say it does not make economic sense nor common sense to make such drastic cuts to education and healthcare because that's what's going to bring you out of your economic downturn. And it's also important to remember that your vote is what put them in office. So they are beholden to us, okay? So don't take this uh, town hall tonight as your only opportunity. It really is about us really working together and having that one unified voice to send that message because again, including me, I work for you. I'm putting on my city council hat for a second. Now I'm going to take it off. So <laughs> back to community organizing. All right. So as promised, another trivia question. As New York State institutes a hiring freeze, it has continued to allow overtime by state employees to get services performed. How much money did New York State spend on overtime in 2008? About $80,000. $485.7 million. So just think of how much money the state would save it if, if it had reduced over time, okay? And that source came from fightthecuts.org, a website that we are responsible for citizen so action, okay? Um, one more question, is that okay? Can I give you guys one more question we go to our next speaker? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, if New York State started purchasing prescription drugs, and this is a good setup for our next speaker, so there was an intention behind it. <laughs> if New York State, started purchasing prescription drugs in bulk for Medicaid patients, state employees, and retirees, how much money would it save? Millions. 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 
it would save around a hundred million dollars every year okay so with that being said, uh, you've heard a conversation about health care. Everyone from our uh, President Obama who said that health care is our priority. Uh, no one can deny the importance of having quality, affordable <laughs> health care, not just health insurance, health care. And so I will now turn it over to Ed Ruiz, who will talk about health care in the context of the governor's uh, budget proposal. He is the administrative organizer for 1199 SEIU. Ed, give him a round of applause. I, I think in, um, in times like this, um, one of the things that we would like to say is, they say cutbacks, and we say fight, fight back. back. So they say cutbacks, we fight say fight back. They say cutbacks, fight we, back. they say cutbacks, fight back. we gotta fight back. Without a struggle, there'll be no change. Um, I am here representing 1199 SEIU. Um, we uh, 40,000, 400,000 healthcare workers across New York State. Um, also, with, I'm here with uh, Menina, who is the healthcare education uh, program um, person, or go to person here in the Southern Tier. Menina. Um, Governor Patterson is proposing massive cuts to healthcare, um, which could total $2 billion. When the loss of federal and health plan contributions are included, you know, we're talking about a big piece of money here. Um, in 2008 alone, Governor uh, Patterson cut almost $1 billion from health care. Um, it was one of the hardest hit areas of the state budget. New York State, um, New York's struggling hospitals and nursing homes, um, at this point right now, they can't withstand any further devastating cuts from the, uh, from the governor. If, uh, if, the gov if Governor Patterson's uh, destructive cuts are passed, New Yorkers will suffer in, I'll just mention a few ways. Hospitals and nursing home closings, which um, I was talking to one of my coworkers today from Buffalo and she told me that one of the nursing homes that she represents, uh, they just heard it over the news that they're, they're shutting down uh, because they can't continue to operate. Um, longer wait, uh, waiting times in emergency rooms, that's uh, some of the things we'll be seeing, reductions in outpatient services, maternity wards, and other vital services, uh, reduced quality of care, and uh, we're gonna see a lot of nurse layoffs. Um, so statewide, we're talking about eliminating 20% uh, of our hospital beds. Uh, we're talking about laying off um, like 14,000 nurses, you know, eliminating four plus million outpatient clinic, clinic uh, services or, or visits. So um, once again, I, I just like to say, they say cutbacks, we say, they say cutbacks and we say, they say cutbacks and we say, thank you. To add a, uh, a personal story to uh, healthcare, uh, I'd like to call at this time Geraldine Hope. Is Geraldine still here? Geraldine, all right. Geraldine is going to uh, share her personal story. And as she's walking up, the governor, you know, in all fairness, there are some positive things with health. Can you come up, Geraldine? Uh, he's proposing to eliminate the uh, easy pa uh, to eliminate the eligibility requirements for applying for uh, Child Health Plus and Family Health Plus, which is a good thing. For those that have applied for public health insurance, you understand quite in detail all the paperwork you have to get, not just going to apply for the insurance, you know, all the additional resources you have to pro provide uh, proof of. So that is something that he's proposing to eliminate. He's also proposing to expand uh, Family Health Plus. Right now, if you're a single individual and you work a minimum wage job, you are over income for Family Health Plus. So one of the things that he is proposing is to expand it so that a single individual, I believe if uh, you earn like $40,000, you'd be eligible for Family Health Plus. So that would cover a lot of people. 
One of the downsides to the uh, health care proposal, in addition to the, the cuts that Ed alluded to, is the proposal to increase the premiums for Child Health Plus. So we're saying in the time of an economic downturn, most people can't afford those, those higher premiums. So that doesn't really make fiscal sense or economic sense. So uh, I'm now going to turn over to Geraldine. She is going to share her story in regards to health care. Geraldine? Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm one of the little people. That's Nobody the way I said. feel. And um, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make a difference. I totally agree with Ed about Fight Back. I am a single parent. I'm raising five grandchildren. I have been in the nursing health care, uh, let's see, I've been doing this for 27 years. And I take pride in what I do. And uh, it really upsets me. They're talking about making these, these cuts here in, in the nursing homes. And um, a half a million dollars. The facility that I work in, that means that it could possibly be closed down, which means we will lose our jobs, nurses, let alone cutting back on the quality of care that we give to our residents and our patients. So what does that mean for me and my family? It means that there is no after school programs. All this, this cuts affects me totally, me and my family totally. No after school programs. No uh, daycare providers. Um, no recreation whatsoever for me and mine. Um, loss of my house. So what am I supposed to do? What are me and my children supposed to do if I'm without a job? Healthcare alone. Health insurance. I try to like balance and budget the best that I can. So what am I supposed to do? Say to help with my children? I work hard. I'm a taxpayer. I want to make a difference. We need not let this happen. Thank you. So we're going to go to our next speaker, but one more trivia question, okay, our next two speakers. And then we're going to go into the, um, the question and sharing portion of our program for about 25 minutes. And then, like I said, as earlier, we're going to get you all fired up, get you all knowledgeable, and then we're going to figure out how do we address these cuts, right? Because that's what we're here to learn, out, learn more about, correct? Okay. So just two more trivia questions, and I promise I won't bore you anymore with that, but... <laughs> <laughs> and whoever gets the answer right to the last question, they get a nice consolation prize. I'm just kidding. The prize is we're all here together. Okay. So, <laughs> Whew, all right. It's been a long day. Okay. Um, my uh, my last two questions. Um, in spite of the tough economy, New York State continues to use private consultants who are paid much higher than the same work that was done by private employees. If New York State stopped hiring consultants for computer programming and other professional services, how much money do you think New York State would save? Millions. Mil over $500 million, okay, over a three-year period. And this comes from the Fiscal Policy Institute. Okay. And my, uh, my last question for the evening, trivia question. I know you guys all enjoyed it so thoroughly. I can feel it. Um, <laughs> My, uh, my last trivia question, and I will turn it over to, uh, to Susie and Carol that are going to talk about uh, the impacts on SSI, and I'm going to lead into that. New York State will save $16.4 million by closing several juvenile correction centers. How much of that money will the state reinvest in its communities? You are absolutely correct. You all win. Zero. <laughs> Not a dime is slated for programs that serve high-risk youth or anyone else for that matter, okay? So our last two speakers uh, from the panel, and then we're gonna go into question and sharing for about 25 minutes. So like I said, I promise to keep us to our time frame. is uh, Susie Link. And um, as I said outside when we were doing the, uh, the, uh, the rally, the uh, governor, the, the, there's a proposal on the table to cut 3% of the, 
of uh, the income from individuals that receive SSI. What is SSI? That's money that goes towards people who are disabled. These are individuals who can't work. This is their only source of income. And we're saying if we're asking our most vulnerable, I mean really our most vulnerable who can't even defend themselves or even go out to seek other work and they depend on other agencies, you know, us as a community for service, if we're asking them to cut 3% of their income, and yet we're not asking the ones that can afford to pay more to even cut or uh, pay 1%, there's something wrong here. We're not moving in the right direction, not only as a community, but as a state and as a nation. And uh, to talk a little bit more about that is uh, Susie Link, and uh, she is a counselor with the Southern Tier Independence Center, and Carol Kramer as well. Give them a round of applause. This young lady thought being 5'2 was rough, try being 3'9. But I have an advantage, and I'm going to show you my neat little trick because of technology working to my best benefit. I'm going to hopefully be a grown up. Hold on, here it comes. <laughs> Chairs are very temperamental. Yes, technology, yeah! It's so, it was so funny. The other day I'm in a grocery store, and there's this little Italian woman who's about maybe four, nine at best, and she's trying to reach the yogurt, and she couldn't reach it. And I said, ma'am, excuse me. I said, let me get that. And she's looking down at me. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we helped each other. You know, I have to tell you, I'm a transient. I'm not originally from this community. I moved to Binghamton back in 1984, and how proud I am of this community. Look at the turnout we have here. You all deserve a big effort. Carol and I both work for an independent living center. We obviously work with people with disabilities. Carol is actually our benefits guru. Thank God we have her. Because the social, yeah. social security makes it so difficult for people to understand that we have to hire specialists to try to figure out all the rhetoric. The average person applying for social security, it can take up to five to seven years before you even get your approval. That's right. You're right? So in the meantime, you're relying on services from the Department of Social Services in hope that you qualify. Right. Earlier, Carol had mentioned the average person receives $761. That's if you live alone. If you are a parent, you are deducted $50 per child. If you're married, you don't get the $761. I know I used to be on SSI myself. My whopping $324.27, and I was a mother of two children. I was married. My husband, who was non-disabled, died at the age of 40 of a heart attack. I was fortunate enough that I was able to go to college, put myself through, thank God for colleges, <laughs> because, you know, I was one of the lucky ones. The health care, if it wasn't for health care, I wouldn't be standing here today. Thank God for all the people who are home health aides. Those individuals do not get paid enough. Okay? Absolutely. Well, that's first-hand experience. So now I, we, I'm going to stick with the 761 as an average, but like I said, keep that in mind. That's only for single individuals. So when I looked in the newspaper, I had the average between $500 and $600 a month for rent. That does not include utilities. That brings me down to $261. Now, Carol mentioned about bus passes. Um, that's handicapped bus passes that went up to $27.50. If you are non-disabled, it's $44.50. Um, so now let's subtract that. That leaves me roughly $284. That has to pay for food. Most people on SSI, for example, may get 15 to $70 that I'm aware of. That NYSEC, that continues to go up and up and up and up. It's great that we have HEAP. That's awesome. But in the winter, an average person might get $700 a month. I mean, $700, excuse me. That's a one-time thing. OK. Because I know some people are in the midst of understanding that heat pays for your NYSEC all winter long, 
Don't we wish that would. <laughs> My last NYSEC bill for one month was $324. And I only rent a two bedroom apartment and there's just my son and I. Um, so I can imagine what everybody else has. It does not count the garbage bags that we have to, you know, the green city bags that we have to pay for. I'm not complaining, I'm just saying this, all these little things, like they add up. Sorry, we had this, no pun intended. <laughs> Whoops. I didn't even think of that, I apologize. I said, no, it's okay. Oh, <laughs> it does not include personal hygiene, like Carol had mentioned earlier. I don't know about y'all, but part of my health condition too is if I don't keep my body clean, who the heck, A, is going to want to come near me. <laughs> Two, talk about bed sores. That can actually kill somebody. Self-respect. I'm a counselor at Southern Tier Independence Center. One of the things that I do is working with individuals to empower them to be the best person they can be. And if you don't have the hygiene products, I don't care what personality you have. <laughs> okay, I can't read mine. Oh, my favorite. Governor Patterson, who wants to talk about healthy eating. We're all going to eat better? Yeah. Let's put taxes on drinks that we can't afford to begin with. We don't have enough money. Majority of individuals that we work for, tell me if I'm wrong, girl, don't have the income to eat healthy. If they get one healthy meal a day, and that sometimes is considered a box of macaroni and cheese and hot dogs, to me, that is not healthy living. Now, if you have children in that equation, you're going to make that dollar stretch. Now, mind you, we're still going on the $761. Um, oh, let's not forget. Some people are fortunate enough that their parents or whomever may have left them cars. What a luxury that is, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. And gas prices were doing what there for a while? You know the cell phones that some of us, out of necessity, like personally, I might see me running around the city of Binghamton going to different appointments, but I use a cell phone. I don't know, I didn't find this out till recently, but there's a luxury tax on cell phones. I didn't know that. Somebody at Verizon pointed that out to me. And I said, that's where I'm at, because my normal bill should be about $40 a month. By the time you had all the taxes, it's about $75. And people say, well, how can people afford cell phones? They're not a necessity. Okay, I, you know what? I was on Social Security. And sometimes you have to rob Peter to pay Paul. Okay, and there were times I couldn't pay my telephone bill. And it took me a long time so I, until I was able to work to pay that back phone bill. So some people go out and they get those prepaid cell phones or, mm -hmm. or cell phones because that's the only option that they have. Susie wanted me to be timekeeper, so I was just telling her that I think it was about seven minutes into the little spiel. But anyway. I'm partially deaf, so I thought she said something. So I was glad to have an opportunity to talk outside, and Susie's reiterated a lot of what I said. And, um, you know, we just have to speak up and let everybody know that this is not acceptable. Okay, so we have another personal story or two. They're going to uh, share their story. It'll be brief. And then we're going to go into the questions because, like I said, we've given you a lot of information. And uh, so now we want to give you an opportunity. I know people have filled out index cards. We want to give you an opportunity to uh, ask your questions. And I'll just I'll reiterate the uh, ground rules for that. So can I have Mary Ann Moore and Elizabeth come up? Can them Give them give their in the context of the uh, SSI cuts, uh, they're going to briefly share uh, their their story, and then we're going to go into the uh, question and sharing uh, portion of our program. Is everybody still okay? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, I'll slide out the way. Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Ann Moore, and this is my friend Elizabeth, and we are in a club called the Stepping Stone through the Catholic Charities. 
I wish you'd all stand up if you could or raise your hands to say that you're here. Show us the group that we are joined together. We are fighting for our issue of cutting SSI. That's our main issue and we work together with teens such as these you know, people here. We are grateful to have connections to all of you because without connections as a team, we would not be able to make it. And with all, all these opportunities to say coming together, we actually could not survive. So we're asking not to cut our SSI and not to cut anything else because if we have that 3% difference in our SSI, Believe it or not, our disabilities, we are fighting. We went to Albany, okay, for this same issue. And we are fighting, speaking out. We are writing letters. We are actually coming in person. And we have talked to the representatives. And we've asked them to understand our point of view to say that we cannot afford any more cuts, not even one penny, because we are striving to survive in today's world, the way everything is going up, all our co-pays, all the extra income that we might have, which is very little, as Susie had explained, that when you are on a limited fixed income, you are striving for your independence, and you are striving to survive. And you try to do it all by yourself. Well, let me tell you what. You're not going to make it. But when you come together as a team, we are going to make it. We are going to survive. We are the survivors. I'd like to say thank you and turn it over to Elizabeth. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Elena Vera. And I, I would like to say, start by saying that I am a 19-year survivor of a violent crime where I was shot through my arm and my chest in an attempted kidnapping. And oh, some of the side effects from that experience was I received a bad blood supply, so I'm now HIV positive, have been since uh, 1990. And having been given that diagnosis, I had a mental breakdown. Before these, uh, this incident happened, I was a functioning part of society. But after having this violence thrust upon me, I, I had fallen into despair, in and out of prison, and it's just been very, very trying. And the governor is proposing to proprietize some of the drugs that are very important to me. We're talking about life-sustaining antiviral drugs. I need my antiviral drugs, my HIV meds. They are important. Every day I take this cocktail so I can live another day that my immune system is kept up. And it's very important that he not cut and prioritize these drugs. It's not only the HIV antiretrovirals, it's also the antipsychotics, the antidepressants. These are life-sustaining drugs for many, many people living on SSI and those not on SSI. My one pill a month is over $1,000. I am taking four different antiretroviral drugs. No, I need my medication. And I would also like to touch on the shoe bill. It, it, it was a promise that people who were incarcerated with mental health would receive mental health services. <coughs> if they are not receiving services and rehabilitation while incarcerated, when they are released, they are set free upon everyone in the community yes. and their behaviors are very disruptive and if they are not treated while in prison then you're unleashing a monster we need people who are incarcerated to have their mental health services because they're going to be all over the place when they come out they need stability before release they need rehabilitation before release and I'd like to thank you for your time. So 
you guys still with me? Yeah. Okay. I said I'm going to keep us to our schedule. And I, I, I got an email, if I can just find where I placed it, of someone. I just wanted to read their uh, story, and then we're going to go into the questions, and we're going to go into plan of action, and how we're going to make these changes occur. Um, let's find that. I'm shuffling my papers. Oh, yes. This is a story uh, from a woman named uh, Constance. I just wanted to uh, share uh, her story with you this evening, then we're going to go into the uh, questions, OK? My name is Constance. I am disabled and rely on my SSI benefits to pay all my bills. I would love to work, but I can't. Medicaid has helped me with my doctor visits and my medications. However, I am still responsible for co-payments for medications and medical appointments. I'm already having a hard time with paying for rent, food, transportation, and household necessities. The SSI cut will force me to choose uh, to cut my vital needs. I have to have my medication to see my doctor. I need money for food. And so oftentimes, I go without. Transportation, I do a lot of walking. Necessities, as you can see, uh, I don't wear makeup, and I depend on donations for my clothes. So if you cut my benefits, you're cutting my ability to survive, and things are going to get so much tougher. I wish Governor Patterson could walk in my shoes. I wish that he could feel me. So, as I promised, and uh, I'm going to stick to that, uh, we do have some folks that would like to uh, either ask questions um, to the panel or to the group. So again, just to reiterate, just going back to the ground rules, we have Amy up here as our timekeeper because I want to make sure we get out enough time. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. All right. So the two questions when you came in that were on the uh, your agenda were the, these two. What cuts are you most concerned about? And have you or someone you know been affected by the cuts? And if so, how? So those were the two questions we were posing to everyone who wanted to ask questions tonight. So my first person I will call, I'm, I shuffled them up. I'll shuffle them again. Um, Andrew Epstein. I guess just I wanted to make the comment. Um, when I was doing, I was part of Camp Action uh, at Citizen Action, which was a great opportunity that they offered to learn about uh, community organizing. And there's a great quote in it that I wish I could remember from Frederick Douglass. The gist of it, though, is that um, anything we do have, any social services we have, anything that's left that, the, that you know, we have to help sustain our lives was not some gift by people in power. It was struggled for. Uh, it was fought for. Um, and we all know that because we're all in this room here together. But that's a message you need to spread um, to everyone you know. Whatever we have is because, I mean, you know, it, well, you know the eight-hour workday, whether even that still exists for a lot of people, I don't know. But um, benefits, um, any sort of insurance, anything we have was, was, was won through struggle um, and sustained struggle and, and commitment to organizing. Um, and there were a lot of different things I wanted to say or something I wanted to ask, but I sort of have forgotten. I, I, I want to thank the panelists and people who organize this very much, but just spread that message that um, these problems aren't going to be fixed by, by the grace of God or by the grace of Barack Obama or the grace of uh, the state government. It's going to be struggled for, and it's going to be fought for. And, and if we do that, if we re recognize our own power, if we recognize the power of, of social movements, um, we can do anything. Uh, we can have anything. Um, So just to, uh, to, to maybe bring back a, a relic from before my time, but I think it's just as, uh, as, as relevant now, uh, all power to the people. Uh, the next question is from Mariam Belly. Did I say that? Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. OK, my name is Mariam Belly. I'm actually Binghamton University's Vice President of Multicultural Affairs. And I wanted to come speak today because a lot of the students that I represent are people of color or people that come from backgrounds where they're underrepresented and a lot of them are first generation college goers. And as a result for them, this tuition hike that's happening is an unnecessary burden on their family. 
for, family, for families like mine, you already had a budget. This was how much we were going to pay for college. And for us to have a mid-year tuition hike without any type of divestment coming from that money going back to the university, we feel as if it's an unnecessary burden. And I wanted the people of the community of Binghamton to know that we stand in solidarity with you because if we're unable to come to college because of these unnecessary tuition hikes, that we're unable to interact with the community and we're unable to give back to the community. I know that there are a lot of members of our campus that do community service work or even oftentimes come to rallies like these. There are a lot of students who are here earlier. And for us, we care about what happens to the community because in order for us to be successful, we need to have a welcoming community. And Binghamton has been nothing but courteous to the students of Binghamton. And we want you to know that we stand in solidarity with you and that whatever happens, we will always be here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question or comment will come from Bruce W. Rowe. Bruce? Good evening. My name is Bruce Rowe. I live on um, Isbell Street. Uh, my problem is this. I'm wondering what Medicaid is uh, up to. For the past five weeks, I've had lightheaded spells. I've been getting uh, sore throat, dizzy spells, um, tightness in the chest, and hard breathing. I've been to the doctors twice. I have Medicaid. Both times, I was prescribed a medication and told that I could get it at the drugstore for prescription. Both times I go to the drugstore, they tell me I can't get it because Medicaid will not pay for it. They told me I would have, that they would call the doctor and I would have to call them back to get special authorization for the medication, okay? And both times I did not get the medication, both times they did not get back to me. I still don't feel good. Some of the dizzy spells are less, it's getting less intense, but I'm still getting the sore throat and some soreness in the chest. Now what's the good of having Medicaid and what's the good of going to a doctor if these doctors are going to charge Medicaid, which they shouldn't be allowed to, to let a, a, a patient come into their office and then prescribe them a medication that Medicaid won't pay for and when you get back to them on this they won't even prescribe a generic brand or a medication that they will pay for. And I had this happen twice in the, this month alone, in the last five weeks. I still don't feel good. My throat feels wrong. I'm getting some, in, uh, you know, some uh, uncomfortable on the chest. And I went to the doctor's twice. I can't get the medication. And when I talked to the nurse, they said, well, it's really not our fault, okay, because the doctors don't know what medications are on the list that Medicaid will pay for and which ones they aren't. So is this their new way of squeezing out Medicaid patients by telling you they can't give you the medication because they won't pay for it, the doctor won't get the special authorization, and they don't get back to you to give you a generic. So what's going on with this? This is not right. It should be rectified. Thank you, Bruce. Our next uh, question or comment will come from Frank Flint. Is Frank still here? All right. Thank you. Uh, being a senior citizen, I could tell you millions of war stories. I've been through just about anything and everything that, except Medicaid maybe, that people have talked about tonight. Um, I work for a company and down the road that uh, I've worked for for 27 years. They decided to leave town. And so it left myself and many other people with no jobs, and no jobs ever available. So we have health problems, my wife and I, uh, all this time and what have you. So we did find citizen action in the mid-90s. And I will say, they've been a savior for me. They've helped me in many, many aspects. So that's one thing. And Richard Kirsch, uh, who was the New York director, uh, has put on many speaks along the way. And one of the things he said that I will never forget is that there's two ways in this country to get things done. One is money. We know that. 
okay? Legally, illegally. And when we speak of maybe a millionaire, is it Mr. Main with the E on the end? Not it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, those that have are so unwilling in many cases to give. There have been some, but as a rule, there isn't. So I expected at age 65 or 62 or whatever to enjoy retirement with my wife and I because of her health issues and because of my health issues and because not, yes, we finally got Medicare when we got to 65, I guess it was, but it doesn't begin to pay the bills, particularly with her taking like 30 medications a day. Yeah, some of them are well into the thousands of dollars. She gets a shot that costs almost $4,000 a month so that her uh, kidneys can function as a for instance. So I live up the road. I got involved as a trustee for the village uh, of Endicott. I guess I might just well say that. I stepped up to the plate like Leah has, and she should be proud of doing what she's doing. Um, in addition to that, I went back to work. I expected to be off enjoying my life, playing softball, my sports fanatic, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, that hasn't happened. So I work at one of your middle schools in the city of Binghamton. So I'm, I'm dealing with the kids firsthand. And they're already very deprived of a lot of things. We can't even get a, a, a basketball outside so the kids can play basketball. Instead, we have to control their fights or whatever because they have a lot of energy. And if we can provide it in a positive thing with youth programs and what have you, they'll use their energy to do that if we guide them that way. So. That's another little aspect, but uh, Fred, um, my time up? Yeah. Okay, I'll leave you with this. <laughs> there is no right way to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. So let's keep going together. And as long as I have life, I'll be here with you. Okay, Tanya Freeman. Yeah, my concerns are about the SSI cuts. Um, I'm on SSI and I have to pay rent, nice egg, my medication. I gotta pay child support for my daughter. I gotta go to the dollar store and buy my necessities and plus go to the thrift store and buy my clothes. And with Governor Patterson taking money from those who are on SSI, that's wrong because we just got that $23 this year and now he wants to take it back, which ain't right. My stepmom's on SSI, and she's struggling. And I can't even, I have to go to Aldi's to get my food, and that's not a healthy place to shop. And I only get $118 in food stamps for two people. And that doesn't work for me, because I, food only lasts me three weeks for two people, and I have to take care of my boyfriend's brothers, too. And it's kind of hard on me to have food. And it's kind of hard for all of us who are struggling with the economy the way it is. And the way the economy is, it's kind of hard for all of us, because I'm not really from Binghamton, New York. I came from the West. Northwest, Billings, Montana, out here. And, and there, they're only getting like 600 and something a month to live on. And plus with the rent going up, my nice egg bill is like over $800. Because I'm struggling to pay it. And it's kind of hard. And that's all. Thank you. So I, I want to do uh, a time check. I know I have a couple of more cards here, but I just want to pose this to the group because I know Mary is going to come up here and tell us all how we're going to address these budget cuts. So we're at 7.55 right now. We're supposed to end at 8 o'clock. Can I ask for an additional five minutes? Yes. Is that okay with everyone? Yes. It's five, maybe seven. I promise it won't be more than that. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? 
Yes? You still with me? You haven't drifted out of me? All right, somebody is hyped. <laughs> okay, so I will have one more. Um, I know we have a couple more cards. I'll have one more card, and then I'll bring Mary up, and then we'll close it off with a couple more stories, and then I'll wrap up our time together this evening. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so Kathy McKenzie. Is Kathy still here? Kathy McKenzie? Yep. I actually had a story, but I'm not going to tell it, because I think that the signs on the wall. Hi, I'm Kathy McKenzie. I'm a self-employed person. And I used to be an adjunct at the university, and I had to, I guess I'll tell you briefly, I had to resign to keep my child's child health plus because Governor Pataki some years ago required that New York State employees or, or prohibited them from getting child health plus <coughs> even if they were part-time and couldn't get New York State health insurance. So I was advised by the health plan overseer for New York State to resign my position in order to keep my child's health insurance. Now, here's the important part. The things we're worried about right now are on top of what's been happening and that have put us all in whatever little situation we're in or whatever grave situation we're in. I don't feel I'm in a grave situation, but I see people in grave situations all the time, including in my family and loved ones and all I have to do is look left and look right and see people that are working hard, kind people, people who, the crossing guard and her son, you know, who can't get Family Health Plus. And they watch those kids every morning and save kids from getting hit by cars every morning. Yeah. Don't forget the focus of this rally, which is that. 6.85%. For how long has that gone on? 20 years. 20 how long? years. 20. 6.85% for three massively disparate categories of income. And nobody's worried or upset that, as the gentleman earlier said, I think it was Bruce said that, how many millionaires or quarter millionaires will give anything? It has to do with whether or not we hold society responsible through our legislators, whom we voted for, and then turn around and we don't say to them, you need to tax the wealthy more. And Governor Patterson, he, he knows this. It's, it's a little mis mysterious to me why he doesn't want to do this. But when I heard him on the radio two weeks ago say, I don't want to take a look at that tax bracket until I see where the cuts can be made already in the budget. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. the, the budget we've been having for all these years has crashed because we haven't done that yet. Because we haven't raised those taxes yeah. yet. And that's what I want you all to think about when you write your letters and your emails and make your phone calls and talk to your legislators, is just hammer them about that tax rate. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> so I'm going to bring Mary up at this time, Mary Clark. She's the Regional Director of Citizen Action. She's also my boss, so I have to bring her up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, I, I think Mary, she's a very How wonderful person. How many minutes does she get? She gets two minutes just like everybody else. Um, Mary is the Regional Director of uh, Citizen Action. She is going to lay out a plan of action for us to take with us as we leave this evening and for those that weren't able to join us tonight if you can spread that message to your colleagues your friends everyone because again this fight uh will not end here in this room tonight it must continue on so if i want to give mary clark regional director of citizen action round of applause and she's wearing my favorite color but <laughs> Good evening. Thank you all for coming out. I think it's so important that we're here today and we're joined with people all over the state to really send the same message. And uh, and what is that message? Tax. Well, we need a fair share tax reform <laughs> and stop uh, the cuts. and stop the cuts. <laughs> and I think I think the governor will hear us. It's unfortunately our legislators and our governor's rep are not here tonight. Um, uh, what? Neither is here. Um, there was. Uh, with, Donna. With Donna called and said she was stuck in Albany. Uh, I know Senator Libis is also having his fundraiser tonight over at uh, number five. And but they were hopefully going to send rap. 
Yeah. And I don't know where Kevin McCabe is. Um, but, the but the mayor was here. <laughs> so one of the things is that we need to take the message to them. And so what do we, I'll have Ed give us that one more cheer again. They say cutbacks, we say They say cutbacks, we say They say cutbacks, we say I'm going to tell you how we can fight back. One of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to schedule call-in days every Friday until this budget is done. And so tomorrow, they were not here tonight, and we need to have them, every one of us in this room needs to call tomorrow morning, call Senator Libis and call Kevin McCabe with the governor's office and say, where were you? We were all here. We had some 200 people out there on the front yard, and now we have some 100, I don't know, 2,550 people in here today. And we have a message for him. And we need to call and say we need a fair share of tax reform, and we don't need these budget cuts that cut vital services to education, health care, uh, and all our vital services. So how many in this room will make the pledge that you will call yes. Yes. tomorrow? Yes. Both yes. of them. Yes, yes you will. <laughs> yes, you will. How many will get two other people to do that? Two other people. OK. All right. That's what we need to do. They need to hear that we were here today and they weren't, but we're going to still carry the message to them. So that's the first thing that we can do tomorrow. Um, every Friday we want people to do that. We do have to, do, one thing we also like to thank our representatives who are supporting us, and Donna Lopardo has already taken the pledge to support the fair share tax reform. So I think we want to thank Donna as well. Uh, so, but we do need to call Senator Libis and, and Governor uh, Patterson tomorrow, and everyone needs to do it and get two other people to do it. The next thing that we want people to do is we need people to collect petitions. We've got uh, tons of petitions out there on the uh, on the as you leave. We want people to really go out, collect petitions, get them back to us. You know, by we're saying by March 25th. Uh, but what we want to do is also and try to get people's emails because if you haven't put your email down, we need it because it's a way that we can communicate to you as things happen quickly because things with the budget are going to be happening quickly and it's going to go week to week so we need to be able to call you out. But every Friday we're going to be making those calls until they do what we want them to do. So is everyone in on that? Yeah. Okay. We have a whole list of other things. We're writing letters to the editor. We're doing a whole variety of things. On a blue sheet you have. One person at a time, everybody. We're asking people to actually fill out that blue sheet and make some commitments because we're going to be doing a lot of tabling, collecting petitions, collecting petitions at work, really trying to spread the word. And if you don't want to call on Friday, it's OK to call other days of the week. But we really need people to organize those calls because we want them to hear from us and hear from us every week until they do the right thing. And every day would be the ideal thing. So we, let's, let's work on that. So I want people to fill that out. And there's going to be ongoing things happening every week. But the first thing is the calls and the petitions that we need people to do. We'll be continuing with visits. A lot of our organizations are going to Albany and throughout the month of March, and we can keep you updated when and where those things are happening. So fill out your form so we can keep in touch with you. But tomorrow, make your phone calls as our first step. And uh, I think we can win this. We're really pushing them. The governor's on the verge like, for you going, well, maybe after we do this, we'll do it. But I think we are going to be able to win this one, but we can't win it if we remain silent. So we need your voices uh, so that we get better choices. So I'm going to let everyone, I know it's a late uh, evening, but thanks. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, oh, oh, Miss Leah. I'm going to turn it back to Miss Leah. <laughs> but um, get the petitions, make the phone calls tomorrow. And uh, we'll keep in touch with you as things happen. Every week, there's going to be activities to do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> Again, give yourselves a round of applause for coming out this evening. Thank you all to you aggressive progressives. Um, <laughs> I just want to wrap up with a few brief comments. Can we also give a hand uh, to our panelists? They did an excellent job. So as Mary said, and as I said at the beginning, our time together tonight was not only to inform you, but to empower you to action. And so please make sure you fill out that blue volunteer form before you leave. Leave it at the sign-in table. Take the orange petition sheets with you, okay? Also, there's a pink sheet that talks, that gives the phone number to our legislators, call them. I just wanna wrap up with a few couple of comments and then thank you all and let you go officially. So, in conclusion, I just want to say, and it's been said throughout our time together tonight, we really do need a fair share tax reform here in New York State, okay? It is about time, way over time, that those that can afford to pay more actually do their fair share so that we're not putting these, I'm almost finished, you guys. Almost finished, guys, have you attended for three more microseconds, okay. It's important that we implement this fair share tax reform plan. And there's actually a, a bill in the Senate right now that reflects this. So it's really important that we make those calls that we ask them to support uh, the fair share tax reform plan so that we're not put in positions where we're asking working families to, uh, to suffer the burden of having their education cut, health care cut, losing jobs, having the sacrifice, but yet we're not asking the wealthier of us to do their fair share. So again, it's really important that you all do not lose sight that this budget is supposed to pass by April 1st. That gives us less than one month. So we're asking you to commit yourselves this month to send this message to fight the cuts. Because what's the quote, Ed, as you said? Can you say it one more time? They say. They say cut back. We say fight back. They say cut back. We say fight back. And we only have less than a month to fight back because again, the legislature is gonna pass this budget by April 1st. So it's really important that you reach out to everyone who wasn't here tonight to ask them to participate in this fight. And I will close our time. I wanna thank you all for your attention, your um, coming out and uh, thank you all. I also wanna thank all of the uh, speakers that were at the rally, the different unions that are here, CSEA, NYSAT, PEF, SEI, 1199-SEIU, Working Family, Citizen Action, did I miss any other groups? No? Stepping Teamsters, Stepping, Stepping Stone, Stone our youth bill, UUP, Stick, Four, Four Seasons. Everyone, you all give yourselves a round of applause. Get home safely. I'd like to thank Amy, our timekeeper. <laughs> yes. And everyone that helped put this together and all of our video recorders that were here tonight, thank you.